O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39. Well, welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study. My name is Carl Luther, and this is KDL Ministries. You know, thank God for the Jews who have accepted Jesus as a Messiah that was prophesied of by Moses and the Psalms and all the prophets. But those Messianic Jews are rather a small number of Jews when compared to the whole of Israel. Like Jesus said, they were the ones who killed their own prophets who prophesied of his coming. They didn't want to hear that what they were doing was evil in the sight of God, so they just silenced them. Sound familiar? And because of what they did to all the prophets before Jesus, along with their rejection of Jesus while he was walking amongst them, he said this, How often I wanted to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And to this day, the Jews cannot see Jesus. Their eyes are blinded. And they won't see Jesus until the days of the tribulation after the rapture of the church. Only then will their eyes be open, and then they'll be able to say, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. But we won't be here. But because of the 144,000 converted Jews during that time and their testimony, there's going to be the largest acceptance to the message of Jesus that's ever been witnessed before on earth. Unfortunately, those saints will be overcome by the Antichrist because they will refuse to take his mark. And many of them will become martyrs for their faith. But again, Jesus' cry to Jerusalem was before he was crucified was, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Which brings us to our story in Ruth. <laughs> and if you're wondering how in the world does that opening scripture relate to our Ruth story, We'll just sit back and relax, but you'll need to pay attention. Okay, let's get into Ruth chapter 3. And if you remember, we left off with Ruth gleaning the fields of Boaz and then getting some pretty unique attention by him. Our last verse said that Ruth gleaned in Boaz's fields from the time of the barley harvest, which is in the early spring, all the way to the wheat harvest, which goes to about mid-July. Okay, let's begin. Ruth chapter 3, beginning verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So we begin with Naomi asking this strange question. Shall I not seek security for you? So what's that mean? Well, remember the words that Naomi spoke to Ruth and her sister Orpah? When she told them to go back to their land of their own home people in, in Moab, she said this to them. Let's look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord grant you that you might find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. That word rest in chapter 1 and the word security in chapter 3 is the same Hebrew word. And what's my point? Well, in chapter 1, that was a prayer that Naomi prayed to God. Then after all that time had passed, and because of God's divine interaction between Ruth and Boaz in their meeting, Naomi's prayer was finally beginning to be answered. She's beginning to see the hand of God working on her behalf instead of against her. So the lesson is, no matter what it is that you're praying for, pray in faith believing. God is sovereign in every aspect of your life. Your prayers are not being ignored when you're praying God's will. He will perform His will at His appointed time. Continuing, picking up verse 3. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, 
put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. Okay, make no mistake. Naomi is urging Ruth to put on the Ritz, so to speak. Go take a bath, put on some good smelling stuff and then put on some nice clothes and then wait till Boaz is finished eating and drinking. The implication being that he's got a nice buzz on and then go uncover his feet and lie down there. Now, I've heard all sorts of things that people insinuate when it says to uncover his feet. Some go on to say that it was more than just his feet she was uncovering. Now, I don't see it that way. And actually, as I'm writing this lesson, I'm reminded of another woman who placed herself at the feet of someone else of some significant importance. You know who I'm talking about? Let's look at Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 39. Now it happened as they went that Jesus entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Mary was praised by Jesus for doing what was right, sitting at the feet worshiping the master. I just thought this would be a nice reference to what Ruth was actually doing since Boaz is, after all, a representation of Jesus in our story. Continuing, pick it up in verse 5. And Ruth said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was cheerful. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Now there's just so much to discuss here. Ruth has gone from calling herself a foreigner, one who would not have been eligible for marrying a Hebrew man, to call herself Boaz's maidservant. Remember the first encounter when she said this? Let's look at Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. And now she says, I am your maidservant. Now, even though a handmaid was considered to be of the servant class, Ruth now understands that her status is one that, who has been grafted into Israel and that she now has the same rights as any other natural-born Hebrew woman. That's a huge step on how she views herself, and I'm sure we can thank Naomi for what she had taught her. But to reiterate the credit that's due Ruth, she's gone from worshiping false gods to worshiping the one true God of Israel. She's left her biological family for the family of God. She's left her homeland to a land and people which she had faith and hope that she would have been grafted into. And now she doesn't view herself as a foreigner anymore, but a handmaid. She now sees herself as a potential wife to Boaz. And she says, now take your maidservant under your wing for I am a close relative. Did you catch that? <laughs> Ruth is repeating what Boaz said over her when he blessed her for the kindness that she showed Naomi. Let's look at Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Ruth is using the same wording and imagery of protection when Boaz spoke a blessing over her. But Boaz wasn't the first one who made that analogy of, of the protection under a wing. God did. <laughs> Look at the connection between the blessing that Boaz spoke over Ruth in chapter 2 when compared to what God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. Let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 through 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. And there's a reference to the word wing and the protection from God. And per our opening scripture, Jesus even said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
how it gathered you like a hen who covers her chicks with her wings. So understand that God uses that imagery of the wing to draw his people in and to protect them with. And here Ruth is saying, now take your maidservant under your wing for you are a close relative. Continue, picking up verse 10. Ruth chapter 3, verse 10. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, we just can't skim over these words without getting a good understanding of what's really being said. What beginning is Boaz talking about? What kindness is he referring to? Well, how about the kindness that Ruth showed Naomi when she said, Entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. Forever you go, I will go. And forever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And now Boaz is saying, Your kindness not because Ruth wanted to marry him. <laughs> That's not the kindness that Ruth's showing. The kindness that she's showing is still towards Naomi. And he says, it's greater than before. And what kindness is she showing Naomi now? Well, what did I say at the beginning of this study? <laughs> this is more of a Naomi story than it is a Ruth story, right? If this young girl, Ruth, decides to marry this older man, Boaz, knowing that she could have easily, how did he say it? go after young men, whether poor or rich, then it's Naomi who actually benefits from their marriage more so than Ruth. I mean, get real. Ruth could have easily gone back home with her sister Orpah and could have gotten remarried and had an entirely fresh new life ahead of her, one where she's not having a glean grain behind the reapers. But instead, she walked in faith. She walked in love. She forsook her people and she forsook the gods of her people. And now she's basically asking Boaz to marry her when she says, cover me with your wings. Folks, that was a female marriage proposal. <laughs> and she's doing it all just to preserve the name of not only her dead husband, but ultimately the name of her father-in-law, Eli Melek. And in doing so, the land that belonged to, to Naomi's dead husband, Eli Melek, will now be redeemed by Boaz, thus saving Naomi from a life of poverty who owns nothing. And this will make more sense when we get to that next chapter. Let's continue, picking up verse 11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you, as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Okay, this is the part of the story that just goes to speak of the virtue of both Boaz and Ruth. He knows that there's a kinsman more closely related to Naomi than himself. But wait a minute, <laughs> didn't the law of Leverett marriage say that it was supposed to be the brother of the deceased husband to take the widow as his wife? If you caught that, great. Pat yourself on the back. And yes, the law does say that. But there seems to have been some wide acceptance by the priest at the time that in the case where there was no brother, then just like the law of the land of the Redeemer, the closest of kin could step in and take the widow relative as his wife. This was the revision in God's law that I spoke of earlier. Just look at it kind of like following the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. So with this knowledge that Boaz had that there was someone who was a closer relative than he was, there wasn't any premarital hanky-panky going on here. Boaz and Ruth remained pure knowing that she could have ended up being someone else's wife, someone within the same clan as Eli Melek. Continuing, picking up in verse 14. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came in to the threshing floor. Now Boaz is seeking to preserve both of their reputations, especially since they both remain virtuous. Also he said, Bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. 
And again, this was to keep anyone from wondering why Ruth was coming out of Boaz's house so early in the morning. So he loads her down with all that grain as if that's what she came to his house for. It's all about appearances. And then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all the things that the man had done for her. And she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, Do not go home empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Okay, that sets up our scene for chapter 4, our last chapter. But before we begin, let me read you this passage in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 17 through 20. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as a covenant with David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. So as we move into chapter 4, you may be asking yourself, what does this scripture with God talking to King Solomon have anything to do with where we're at in our study? Well, before we continue, there's a point that I really, really need to try to drive home. And that is the ownership of the land called Israel. Now, because of our Western thinking, we look at land and even property ownership as the right to anyone who has enough money and credit. They can enter a legal contract and purchase a house and some land or a house on some land, right? I mean, you sign the papers, and once you pay off that mortgage, that property belongs to you, barring property taxes. But with a Hebrew mindset, at least back in the times that we're studying, they didn't look at land ownership of Israel as such. They knew that this entire piece of real estate called the promised land belonged to God. And at the heart of Israel, in Jerusalem, that's where God made his name to abide, literally. Remember my study a while back when I showed you the letter Shem? which is the one letter that every Hebrew person associates with the name of God, and how in that aerial view, it showed the letter Shem literally carved within the mountains of Jerusalem. So when God said that Jerusalem is where he makes his name to abide, he meant it literally. And the children of Israel knew this. Again, God's warning to King Solomon, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. So when it came to land ownership, every tribe of Israel knew that their land was given to them as more of a right to be there than anything else. It was in their possession, but they didn't own it. It belonged to God. And Scripture will continue to point this out as we continue. And when you study everyone's favorite book of Leviticus, you can begin to understand the Hebrew mindset a bit more clearly. And let me show you what I mean. And, and bear with me, because for us to really appreciate the story of Ruth and the kinsman land, the Redeemer law, then we need to really work our way through that part of the law that explains what's happening in our story with Ruth. Let's take a look at the book of Leviticus, and let's look at the law for the year of Jubilee. So look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. And the time of seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Okay, let's take this real slow and not just rush through these words as though everybody understands what's being said. Do you remember me referring to the seventh year rest a few months ago? It's where the land of Israel was supposed to be at rest that entire seventh year. It was considered a Sabbath year for the land. Well, that's what's being counted here. When it says you shall count seven Sabbaths of years, that means to count seven, seven-year Sabbaths, and that comes to 49 years. Seven times seven. Okay, continue, picking up in verse nine. Then you shall cause a trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. 
Okay, I just coincidentally gave a short pre-lesson last week on the Day of Atonement. <laughs> now I think I know why. But God is saying that in that 49th year on the Day of Atonement is when all this year of Jubilee stuff is about to happen. And what happens on the year of Jubilee? Let's find out. Let's pick up in verse 10 and 13 through 15. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. Verses 13 through 15. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. Okay, let's unpack what we just read because I know it can kind of sound confusing. But fortunately, we've discussed some of this in other lessons, so it shouldn't be completely new. All right, let's begin with the basics. In the year of Jubilee, all families, for whatever reason, if they lost possession of their tribal property, they were to return to their homeland and to their inheritance, to the land of their tribe, their portion of God's promised land. And what does that mean exactly? Well, let's go back even further. When Joshua crossed over the Jordan River and they began to conquer all the inhabitants of the land, Joshua divided the entire promised land up into 12 parts. Each tribe got their inheritance of land that God gave them to inhabit. Now, we've studied this too before, but within each tribe, there were clans. And within each clan, there were families that made up those clans. Remember that? So the land that was given to each tribe was supposed to stay within that tribe. Let's just use our state boundaries as a crude example. Texas cannot acquire property from Oklahoma, and Oklahoma cannot acquire property from Arkansas. You, you get my point? But we all know that life happens, right? And in times in Israel, a family within a clan may have fallen into hard times, whether it was a result of mismanaged personal affairs or, or perhaps some tra tragic misfortune that some family had. But whatever the case was, sometimes a family may have been forced to sell their land. But the land was not theirs to sell. The land belonged to God. Israel were more like tenants who were given the right by God to be there. Now, just hang tight with me. If someone did sell their land, and I covered this a while back too, but the price of the land never sold for what the fair market value for real estate would have been. So what did they sell it for? However much crops that could have been produced before the next Jubilee. And that's what we just read. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor, and according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. So let me explain it just a little bit more. Say if the year of Jubilee was 30 years from now, and let's say each year's crops could produce, let's just say for easy math, $1,000 a year. You could sell your land for $30,000. But in 30 years, at that point in time of Jubilee, the land would eventually come back to you as your family's inheritance. Now on the flip side, if there was only two years remaining for the year of Jubilee, a family could only sell their land for two years worth of crops, $2,000. So this part of the law prevented an evil heart from saying, I'll just sell my land for many, many thousands of dollars, knowing that the next year, the year of Jubilee comes and I get it all back. But more importantly, the year of Jubilee ensured that the land, God forbid that it ever got sold to a foreigner or even another member of Israel belonging to another tribe, but within a 50-year time period, the land would go back to the tribe, clan, family that it was given to by God. So the land itself was never actually sold. So what was? The crops that could have been produced before the year of Jubilee. This was God's law. This was His way. Continuing, picking up verse 16. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price, and according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of the years of crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, my case in point that I already explained. Now let's skip down to verse 23. The land shall not be sold permanently. 
for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Okay, are you beginning to see my point? <laughs> Continuing, picking up verse 24. And in all of the land of your possessions, you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if his redeeming relative, and there's our word Goel, or the next akin redeemer of land, if he comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother has sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale and restore the remainder to the man who he sold it to, that he may return to his possession. But if he is not able to have restored it to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, it shall be released, and he shall return to his possession. Now this, my friends, is the basis of a Ruth story. This is a law that we're about to be seen being applied. The redeeming relative is a term I've been using, the Goel. And he's the next of kin who has the right to redeem the land in question. Again, this ensured that the land stayed within the family and did not go outside the original tribe. And that's a very important concept to grasp for our study of Ruth. And if you can grasp this point, you'll be light years ahead in your understanding of what's going to take place shortly in Ruth, Ruth chapter 4. Okay, I hope I didn't lose you in my attempt to explain all this. And if I did, go back and reread my notes and let it sink in. Okay, let's try to get through chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4, beginning verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, a close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they all sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belongeth to our brother Eli Melech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Okay, so in my attempt to explain the family makeup of Israel and the 12 tribes, and within those tribes you have clans, and within those clans you have families, I understand that when Boaz said, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belongeth to our brother Eli Melech, Boaz is not saying that Eli Melech was his brother as, I mean, as an immediate family member. You have to look at the language being used where he calls this man, who, who by the way, his name is never mentioned, and if we have time, I'll connect some dots for you. But he calls him a close relative. Brother here is just a generic term being used. It only implies that they are all of the loins of Israel. Continue, picking up verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Okay, so what just happened? <laughs> First, this distant relative with no name says, I'll redeem the land. But then when he's told about Ruth and having to perpetuate her dead husband's name and his inheritance, he then backs out. So the question is, did Naomi or even Eli Melech sell this portion of land when they hightailed it out of Bethlehem when the famine hit? Or was Naomi still in possession of the land? Well, you have to look at it through Hebrew law. Landowners were not allowed to glean in another man's field. That was the right of the poor, remember? If Naomi still had possession of the land, even though she herself may have not been able to farm it due to her age, she could have at least placed tenants on it to farm it for her. So the notion that Naomi still had possession of the land and this distant relative with no name was having to buy it back from Naomi and Ruth, that makes no sense. Thus, that's why the distant relative had to back out and said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. What that means was, if he were to purchase or redeem that land back from whose hand it was sold, then he'd be out that money. 
Okay, so let's look at it as investment. But it was not an investment. <laughs> per the law of levirate marriage, which is being thrown in this entire mess, he would have been required to raise a son through Ruth to perpetuate her dead husband's name. And guess who would have inherited all that land? The man with no name? <laughs> nope. <laughs> the son that he raised through Ruth. That was the law, and that was part of the reason for Leverett marriage, to perpetuate the family name and to ensure that family's land inheritance. So the man says, I can't afford to ruin my own inheritance for my existing family. So deal me out. Okay, real quick before we close. Why was this distance relative's name never mentioned? Well, let's go back to the law. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 7 through 10. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him whose sandal was removed. So understand this, it was not mandatory for any brother to perform the law of levirate marriage, but it was expected. And when the closest of a kin declined for whatever reason, he was disgraced. Now, I won't go as far as to say that his name got blotted out of Israel, but he certainly wasn't honored either. So the Bible never mentions his name, but Boaz, <laughs> he went down in history as one of the greatest men of the Old Testament. Let's finish out our story. Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, <laughs> I keep telling you this is a Naomi story. Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Amadad, Amadad begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. And of course, we all know that Jesus came from the royal bloodline of King David. So our story began with there being a famine in the land of Bethlehem, the house of bread, where there was no bread. And it ends up with the wheels in motion for the bread of life, Jesus, to be born in the house of bread, Bethlehem. How ironic is that? <laughs> and this will conclude my lessons on a story about a girl named Ruth. I'll see you all next week.